です。My name is Nicole Hansen. I'm a member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. And on this channel, we are learning to pattern our lives after the holy order and pattern of God as we see in his temple patterns. And on this video today, I'm going to expand more. On my last video, we went over time. It was a long video. It was a three-hour video. And on that video, we talked more about um, concepts, ideas, theory, a little bit of uh, science of relativity with time and um, theology. And today what I want to do is kind of, okay, so what, how do we apply this? And I've had some people say, okay, so I believe it. Now what? <laughs> At, which is a great, um, a great mindset to have because I think way too often um we believe things and then do nothing about them to further to that faith part, the action part, taking action. Um, and so we just say, okay, that's great. And, and move on. And then yet we criticize other religions for saying things like, well, all you have to do is believe in Christ and no works, just believe. And so we make fun of them and yet we're kind of doing the same thing. <laughs> when we say oh yeah i believe i believe and then we don't do any action to further those works and, and when speaking specifically to the temple ordinances and the covenants um we go and do them and say great i'm done and haven't done anything to fulfill them and so it, we're no different than saying well, it's enough to just believe it's enough to just go to the temple get your endowment and i'm good that's no different to me than saying I believe in Christ and that's enough. I don't need anything more. And so <clears throat> today <laughs> we're going to talk about like application of such a thing. And so it's it's great when when people say, okay, how do I apply this? Um, that that is, you know, Christ said that the meek would hum the meek would inherit the earth, the meek and humble. And when I looked up what meek meant, it meant teachable. And um, that kind of that ability to plant a seed inside and then grow it and do something about it, not just say, okay, yeah, sure, I believe that. And it'll work itself out. Um, and we've talked a lot about the Oliver Cowdery thing, but that, that's not at all what the Lord wants for you to just say, okay, I believe and that's enough. Or, I mean, he told Oliver Cowdery, you took no thought but to ask me. Like, you, you, you got to go ponder on it. You got to do something. The faith part is like the biggest part to get energy and motion to get things going. And um, we see that all over the prophets and the scriptures. They had to act. They had to do something about it. They believed, but the belief was not enough. It's something they had to act upon. And one, one of these days we'll do a video about um, the, the quantum physics and lectures on faith and just that acting in movement um, to get us progressively closer. So today we're going to take all the theory and the things, the ideas of what we talked about in the last video of time, and we're going to put it into, okay, so now what? How do I act on this? And of course, I don't have all the answers. The answers are in the doctrine of Christ. And so that will, he will speak to you through that. But I'm going to give some ideas <laughs> that aren't going to hurt. <laughs> and I think actually by small and simple things, great things are brought to pass. So I'm going to lay out some small implications of putting time into order and, um, and some, some things I think actually would have a lot of power, things that I felt prompted to do in my life. And um, so the last video, just a refresh, we kind of talked about how time for us 
seems linear, but for God, it's multidimensional. If you think of the theory of relativity, um, time is relative, dependent on where you are from the source of light, how distant you are from the source of light, and that distance then creates space. We have time and space. Um, Gravity is a whole other to topic we'll get into later when I feel there's something worth saying there. But <laughs> Um, so, but those are the, those are the trifecta of things that create the, the realm in which we live. And then when Christ came, he broke the bands of time space. And, um, and so he also allowed us the ability to come back into the presence of the father, that light, that light source. And so we're no longer distanced from the source itself. And we kind of talked about lightning and thunder, the, the closer you get to the source, the quicker you hear it, um, all the time in the scriptures, the the voice of thunderings. Um, the Israelites were supposed to go to the mountain, and they told Moses, oh, "It's too scary. <laughs> you go see what he wants and come back." But it was that power and being able to withhold that power and be in its presence, um, where he will be. So, and preparing for his second coming learning to overcome those bonds so that we can be found in his presence, which would mean being found in his order. And we talked about that time for him is, is really order, that things happen in their perfect time and season, just like a great solar system, that being in the right place and in, in the right time. And then in doing that, we find any rest or protection from the chaos of the world coming at us if we're in the right place at the right time. So a lot of those theories we talked about. Um, so now we're going to, we're just going to talk about like, how can we apply small principles if we, if we have more of a belief in this and we're understanding what are some principles that could relate to us gaining power in this, in the Lord. And so with that, uh, where to begin? I'm going to tell a story. Well, I, I told it in the last video. I'm going to rehash it out here um, because it's completely applicable. Uh, but when I was about 11 or 12 years old, I had a friend next door and we were, her dad was out flooding the lawn and we went outside and we're, we made a slip and slide in the grass. And so we were slipping and sliding in the grass. And <clears throat> I heard a distinct clear voice um right here over my shoulder as if somebody was talking to me and my they're not always that prominent um there's been a lot of times in my life where it has been but um sometimes it's a lot softer voice uh just side note i feel like when i've learned it's the lord's voice it's a lot quieter <laughs> because that's we're, we're learning to get closer to him, but maybe getting louder as we do get closer to him. Um, so, but, but, and we talked a little bit about the difference of, um, you know, there's a difference between angels, the spirit, the Holy ghost and the Lord's voice. But, um, this time I heard a voice very, very loud and clear. And, and I felt like it was an angel and said, um, don't go, don't go again, or somebody will break their ankle. Now, I interpreted that as Michelle, let's go one more time and then be done because I feel like somebody's going to break their ankle. <laughs> okay. So, I mean, here's the story. This is, this is us learning to hear the voice of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> so I got it wrong. Uh, as Elder Bednar says, when he talks about Nephi, when Nephi got it wrong, he says, no, he didn't get it wrong. <laughs> it's the process of learning. I clearly learned something huge from this experience. I was told the voice said, don't go again. And I told my friend, let's go one more time and be done because I feel like somebody's going to break their ankle. So she went one more time and uh, I didn't even get to go again. <laughs> and she, um, she broke her ankle and her ankle ended up completely turned around. So the ankle bone was in the front of her foot and it completely shattered her growth plate. She's had issues with it ever since. And um, it was a pretty big, um, a pretty big issue. But from that, I learned a big lesson to listen when you're told and act immediately. And, and over the years, I've realized, you know, that iron rod is the word of God and thinking that personal, uh, especially with what President Nelson's been saying to us 
<clears throat> since he's been prophet is that personal revelation and that without it, you will not be able to spiritually survive, survive the days ahead. And uh, we've talked a lot about the spirit of revelation and why that's so critical and important. And, and that it, it surely is the light, the oil in the lamp um, that we're gathering to be ready to know him. And so um, learning for myself, the iron rod for myself, that when, when I am told, whether it's by angels, the spirit, Holy Ghost, the Lord himself, um, they all speak by his power, that when I am told to do something, how quickly do I, how quickly do I respond? And is that important? Like if you're told to go do something and then you wait and delay it, knowing oh yeah i'm supposed to do that does it matter the time in between i think with oliver cowdery we saw that surely it did by from chapter eight to chapter nine in doctrine and covenants we see that the lord says oh it's no longer sufficient for you um essentially your time's up <laughs> and so and we we talked about this in the last video with the world and coming you've had this much time to come to know me time's up um and so <clears throat> And President Nelson's really hitting home on this personal revelation. So learning to hear and obey immediately, I think there's a lot of power in the quickness in which you respond. And, I, and I'll hopefully give some examples of that today to help really emphasize how important I think that is. I think it's everything because it will bring you to eventually the presence of hearing and seeing at the same time, the source by which you are guided. So what we want to be doing in application is um, practicing in our lives to hear and obey, to hear and obey. And do we get it wrong? Yes. But do we learn in the process so that next time we're not going to get it wrong? Like because of the experience I had where my friend broke her ankle, I pondered on that a lot throughout my life. And when I clearly identify a voice or something, I, I do it as fast as I can. I learn right away. That's something I don't want to be caught not doing again. And, and how it not, it, it didn't affect me physically. It affected somebody else. And that's even harder because my choice affected somebody else. Right. And so we talked about that in the last video too, entropy and how we're kind of bumping in here based off our choices and things. But as we all learn God's order together, that we learn to live in more harmony together perfect flow, perfect rhythm. In fact, that brings me another point I want to talk about, but um, that we will come together in harmony and rhythm and um, and be like sight in one heart and one mind. And so we'll talk about a few examples of that today. Um, <clears throat> so we did talk about entropy, chaos, chaotic order versus order, matter unorganized versus God order, putting things into order. By the way, I think this is why so many, it's so much easier for women. There's always more women at the temple. There's a, <laughs> a lot more women in the highest kingdom because women, this is just, this is not doctrine. This is just a something I always think about, just a funny side note. But women, mothers, <laughs> women of any kind, we have a good, we have a good way of um, taking chaotic order and putting it into order. <laughs> so, uh, if you could see my house right now, it's, it's uh, entropy. And, you know, when we, we learn to get that together and we, and we try to do better with our kids. Okay. That went awry. Let's do it. So next time we do better. And, and so in this way, this is part of our learning is chaos into order and, and women are very good at that. <laughs> so, um, Anyway, so we, we talked a little bit about entropy and, and matter and organized chaotic order versus being in God's holy order, which would be more like a, a perfect harmony solar system type thing where everything happens in its perfect time and order. And with that, I think the last time I compared it to um, like a gas system, a gas phase where the molecules just kind of bump into each other and they just fill the space and just bump wherever. And that's more chaotic order versus like a crystalline phase of existence, like a, a, a crystal or a quartz. And that that is like solid in its harmony. And so energy can flow 
um, more, more precisely through a system like that. Um, and, and then we compared that to the celestial kingdom being like a sea of glass and the Urim and Thummim, past, present, and future, and how that's related to time. I don't go over that. We did that in the last video. But I did just want to relate that. Something I should have related in the last video was um, quartz. And quartz is, you know, this type of solidifying feature of rock. And um, and that's what they used to tell time with, quartz clocks. So I just, it kind of dawned me on me after we did that video that, a quartz clock. <laughs> We're talking about time and being uh, a system of complete order. And so we we use to tell time with a quartz clock. And, and then the time with God would be different. It would be all seen. And he is like a celestial kingdom. He is like a that crystalline structure, perfect, perfect harmony and order. So that was something I just wanted to address that kind of came to my mind after I, I did the last video was like, yeah, and and I'm not. I when we were trying to get our counters done in our kitchen, um, we went looking at different types of stones. There's marble, uh, granite, quartz, quartzite, and then quartz, which was man-made. Um, and uh, along the journey, I remember one of the people telling us, "Yeah, it depends on how long it's been." I don't know what the right word is, but like curing <laughs> in the mountain or like where the stone's at in time, where where it is in its progression, essentially, is dependent on how how hard it is. So marble is a more soft stone where the quartzite is really um, solid and it's also very see-through. Okay, and then thinking about that and, you know, things we've talked about in the past, the brother of Jared going up and molting these, these seer stones and having the Lord light them. And so just thinking about time that we're now relating time to the spirit of revelation, to the Lord being revealed to brother Jared. Sorry, if you haven't been watching the videos, it's going to start getting harder to keep up. But um, <clears throat> the quartz, I'm pointing to the quartzite in my counter. It has, it's a little bit of both granite and quartzite, but it's, it, it the quartzite will begin to become clear. And um, I just think that's really fascinating. Um, just the nature of stone itself. Um, in fact, I, when we were reading about when when Satan tempted the Lord to turn the stones to bread, I thought about that and I thought that's not the create that's not the measure of the the creation for sand or stones or rocks. They seem to have a purpose in the Lord's eyes, and so part part of it might have been that. Satan was trying to convince him to use his power to go against God's order in creating something that he wanted for him. And anyway, side note, but that was just something that stood out to me. The more I learn about, you know, the Lord doesn't make a, a peach seed and then turn it into a cherry tree. That's not his way. That's not his order. And so Satan would like to tempt us out of God's order of doing things. And and that's it's a reason, like, when I have a lot of friends that are um struggling or see a lot of people struggling with the way things are because they know well in a heavenly sense this is how it should be and and I always just come back to my heart I'm like yeah but things have to be done in order we can't go straight to this or we're out of order we're missing the process of becoming along the way it's the journey is a part of that and so it, it doesn't really frustrate me if things aren't the way I think they should be within the church because we're all coming to higher order together as a whole. And just because one individual might be ready for something that that could get them to a place of pride that could have them fall, or they could continue. I think there's individuality in coming in God's order. We see that with the prophets, all the characters of the scriptures, but that doesn't set us above everybody else in their, their level to rise as well. And so as soon as we start thinking, well, this is wrong because this and this, we have to do this together. And if we don't do this together, then we're we're at the level which we can do. And so, you know, I think of moving through that tabernacle, uh, Moses tabernacle that we talk about here is where's the church at as a whole at this? 
Um, and I think the prophets kind of what they speak kind of shows where where we are as a whole. And that um, even in our own spiritual progression, we cannot forget God has order and he has a specific way of doing things. And we cannot abandon everybody else thinking that, well, we're progressing faster. Or we, we have to be there with everyone else. Just Moses didn't leave them behind because he was performing all these miracles. He was performing the miracles for the people. <laughs> it's like, and so um, there's, there's not a lot for me. There's not a lot. It, there's so many issues out there right now with people in the church. And there's just not a lot of those issues for me because I feel like, yeah, things happen in their order. And um, if we're not ready, the church isn't ready. <laughs> if the people are are falling, we saw that with the Israelites. And anyway, that's not what I want to talk about. Well, we can touch on that another day. But um, so I wanted to talk about that. Um, the the quartz clock and the entropy. Just go over that again. The story of the girl. Um, one thing I noticed about my daughter is that I I just she's five years old and started noticing like a year or two ago <laughs> like I would tell her hey don't do that I don't want you to do that you'll get hurt or uh, you know I would be whatever she's climbing on something hey I want you to get down well then she'd ignore me and she'd fall down and then she'd get hurt and then hey don't play with that you might cut yourself and she'd ignore me but sure enough she cut herself and after a while I started to notice I'm like I told you that I told you that <laughs> you did it anyway and sure enough you got hurt and of course, what an analogy for God saying, hey, don't do that. And how many times personal revelation, he's saying, hey, stop or do this and whatever. And we're like, oh, that's a good thought. And then we kind of delay. And then before you know it, we're hurt. And just today I was reading, somebody put a post up about how they had pulled, they had pulled into a parking lot and they heard a, a small impression tell them that they need to park in the back. And they thought, oh, that's silly. And they ignored it and went to the front and they skid and hit another person's vehicle. And again, it affected somebody else. It, and, and that's when, sorry, if it affects you, you're like, oh, I should have done that. But the thing is, we couldn't have, we couldn't have expected it was going to affect somebody else. You know, if we'd known that, we might have been a little bit more cautious. And <clears throat> so I just thought it was a really good story the person shared that, you know, I'm, I'm going to listen next time. <laughs> Like and he kind of attributed it to the same point. How many times do we listen or do we hear things and then we are not in the Lord's protection because we didn't obey what he said to do? Um, and then what kind of ripple effect does that cause and what causes entropy? And, and we're all subject to it because we're learning, right? So was it wrong for him to avoid to miss that that not obey it right away well no because he learned the lesson he needed to learn right i think it was elder holland gave a talk once about sometimes you need to go in the wrong direction so that you know it's the wrong direction <laughs> and and then next time you'll get it right and that's kind of what an intelligence system does is it learns for sure what's wrong and then it's programmed so that the next time it will never make that mistake again right um and then you get that greater light. And then now you're way more subject if you sin against the greater light. You you now know and you avoid it anyway. And you've been given the knowledge, right? <clears throat> so sometimes I think about that sinning against the greater light in, in relation to my own. Like, I know this. And if I were to not do this, um, then that would be that would be me going directly against what I know to be true. And in these ways, I found that I feel like the closer I try to get to the Lord, it, it gets harder because the voices, um, the other voices are loud. And a lot of times, I think we're always these people. We're always being acted upon by the wrong voice. And some, a lot of times we are the wrong voice to somebody else, not out of not and we do it out of love and just ignorance to what we think is right and so what i mean by that is like sometimes i'll be told something by the lord and i i'll know it and then i'll have a, a voice of a friend or somebody who says something counter to it in fact it always happens the point i'm starting to realize <laughs> and um it always happens it will happen 
And it's not that that person's trying to deceive me. It's just, they don't know what I was revealed to. And out of love might say, well, I'm just concerned for you. And I, I, I think this would be the better option for you. And I've acted on that voice a lot throughout my life thinking, oh yeah, well, yeah, this person. And it makes me doubt the voice that I heard. And I think but this person loves me. And so I'm weighing that. And then I, I follow the voice that was not the Lord's because I know that it was a voice out of love too. And, and then I later see, yeah, I was told not to do that. And um, so a, an example of that, that we see in the scriptures <laughs> is my husband just pointed this out the other day was Peter. So Peter had been told that he was Cephas, right? We talked about that in the spirit of revelation videos that, and we're going to talk about why he became the head of the church in a minute, but he was told, Peter, you're so great. You did it. You, you became Cephas. You are the head of, I'm going to found my church on you. The Lord says that. So this is Matthew 16, um, verses, I don't know, maybe starting around 15 or something, but verse 23. So the Lord just tells him, you're so great. You did it. I'm going to build my rock upon you. Uh, you are the rock of my church. You did it you know who I am, you know me, and the father has revealed it to you. And then in the next verse, well, then Peter says, he tells him, the Lord tells him, I'm going to, I'm going to die on the cross. I'm going to be with you. And, and then Peter says, essentially don't go stay here, you know, out of love. Peter is like, this is going so great. We love you. Just stay. And and then in verse 23, Matthew 16, 23, I think it is, he says, the Lord tells Peter, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and it's like, you just you put him up as you're the greatest of fight. You're going to be what the entire church is founded on. And nope, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> so he calls him the greatest. And then he calls him Satan in the, in the next verse. And the irony of that is, is it, creates a little bit of a paradigm shift is how often we are well okay and then we need to talk about what is it that Peter what did Peter do that made him the rock of the church <clears throat> which we talked about Joseph Smith uh translated that into seer the seer um and we talked about how that's in relation to like being a seer a seer stone and he is the rock of the, of the church um which is a stone and so Peter, um, what Christ told Peter was, you came to know me and it was revealed to you by the father. It wasn't, essentially, if you go read that chapter, it wasn't the world that said anything or testified of me. It was no person. It was no man who told you who I was, but it was revealed to you by the father. Essentially, it's the spirit of revelation. That's what we talked about that Joseph Smith um in the writing teachings of Joseph Smith book, page 150, 151, the spirit of revelation, he says, this is in connection to the first and second comforter, that um, you will grow into the principle of revelation until you become perfect in Christ. And then our prophet today is very first talk, grow into the principle of revelation, and he's preparing you to know Christ. And so it was that thing that it was revealed to him through revelation, talking about the oil and the lamp, the revelation that made Peter, Peter the head of the church. And so um, that made him see this, the rock, I'm going to build my rock upon this church, which is revelation. And, you know, we learn in the temple, the temple is um, revealed by revelation and to be understood by revelation. And so the, the church is based on a foundation of revelation. So again, what is revelation? Uh, you know, a sea of glass, <laughs> stuff. Um, past, present, future, all that. And so being given, being given something in the past that then helps you in the future know what to do. If you've ever experienced revelation, you know, sometimes something that was given to you 20 years ago now makes sense today. And, and then it continues to expand. And so it, it combines past, present, and future, and hopefully getting to be like our father where all things are before us. 
and will be in the celestial with him. So Peter, this is the foundation of the church, is he pretty much exemplified the spirit of revelation and he now knows the Lord. And why, why would that be so important? Because if you look at uh, Laman and Lemuel, right? They saw an angel, but it was not enough to get them to believe. Essentially, seeing is not believing. That's one of the biggest things we're going to seeing is not believing. So do you not think that that would then apply to Jesus Christ? That if you were to see him, you wouldn't, you wouldn't believe it just by seeing him. That's a whole story of the Pharisees. When he came, they had no idea who he was. And then Christ tells us, Peter, you did it. You know who I am. It was revealed to you. <laughs> it's like, you, you have to know. Um, I, I talked about elder bednar in my last video when he said before the brother of jared saw the finger of the lord he first saw the stones light up so he knew that the lord was there prior to seeing him he was gaining a witness that he was seeing it before he saw it if that makes sense rather than the finger parting the lord and touching the stones that is in people always ask me the ones i reference so that is in elder bednar's talk on the character of christ and he was talking to a group of missionaries it's towards the end of that video anyway um and so lighting up your you're lighting up right the you're the stone that's lighting up the, gaining greater light and knowledge until you know the lord and so peter there we go you did it so I feel it's safe to say that just like Laman and Lemuel with the angels, the same goes for Christ. You would see him and not know him if you didn't already know him. And that it's in the knowing him that that would beget the seeing rather rather the other way around. And that's that's how some knew him and some did not. And <clears throat> I think it was in our can follow me today actually in the chapters of john that um he's telling the pharisees you you have no idea who i am you your heart's far from it you don't even, i could t and they said well why don't you just proclaim it why don't you just tell us who you are he said i did and you didn't believe me it's like and then he went to his hometown and tried to tell him and they didn't believe him and so quite obvious in order for us to know the Lord and be ready for him and tying this back into the second coming when he comes at the perfect place and time for us that we shall say him for we shall be like him we will know him so the point of that is it's crucial for us to learn his voice whether by the power of the Holy Ghost or angels ministering or his voice himself that we need to come to understand those things and that we will be tested and tried and it may be our own Peter, right? Peter was the head of his church and then he called him Satan in the next because he knew that Satan was trying to te tempt him. And so we do that a lot to people. I think we're all at fault for that, for saying, being the voice that doesn't understand what the other person is being told. And, and are we wrong for that? No, I think the Lord allows that to happen to be tried. And especially, you know, do you love that voice more than me? <laughs> I told you this and they told you that and that was comfortable. And so you went with that and that that was negating the purposes I had for you. And so that's been something I've had to grapple with the last couple of years is, is the more I clarity I hear that voice, um, I'm beginning to get better at spotting when, when another voice is, is saying against what what I was told. And I had to learn that the hard way by saying, yeah, I was told to do this. I didn't do it. And then this happened. And so now was it wrong? No, it was teaching me. So I got back, back in line. Okay. Next time. Um, but that's one of the hardest things because we do, we, we say so much out of love and, um, and Peter really just loved the Lord. Didn't want to see him go through this, wanted him to stay. They were doing so much good. But the Lord knew, no, I have a purpose that has to be fulfilled. And the devil will try anything to get me to stop that. He knows. Okay, with all that said, application things. Um, when I first got married, uh, the word that we were living in, we went to a tithing settlement. And the bishop gave us a 
talk. I can't remember who it was by. I held on to it for a while. I'm sure I saw it somewhere. I can't remember. I'd like to find it again. But it gave us a talk to read. And um, what I took from the talk, <laughs> I can't tell you which one it was. I, I can tell you the principle I learned. What I took from the talk was essentially, it had something to do with putting God first. And I went home and was thinking about that. And I remember telling my husband, I think that, there's something to this. I think that we need to, what I'm hearing from this is that we need to learn to put God first in everything. And so how can we practice that? That's the faith part. That's, that's a good thought. And we say that, but then we're so general about it. Okay. Well, how can we actually practice that? Show me ways that I can practice that. And, and my first thoughts were, well, if we're going to pay tithing every month, let's play it at the beginning of the month, not at the end of the month. Um, if we're going to go to the temple every month, let's do it the first of the month, not the last of the month. If we're going to do home teaching at the time, let's home teaching. Let's do it the first of the month, not the end of the month. Um, and and then fine tuning that to every day. If I'm going to read my scriptures every day, I'm going to do it at the beginning of the day, not the end of the day. The first thing I'm going to do when I wake up, I'm going to pray. I'm not going to let anything come between me and prayer at the beginning of my day. Now is a whole new level of hard <laughs> when you have kids and you wake up every day to somebody saying, mom, I need you. I need you. I need you. Then it's like, okay, I want to pray. <laughs> I don't know how. <laughs> so prayer in the heart. But, but with that, I'm finding, well, how do we put God first? Even in that situation, I've got to learn. I got to go back to the beginning. I go back to the law of sacrifice. The obedience part is put me first. Okay. That's the law of obedience. Now I got to put the law of sacrifice into play in order to make that happen. I'm going to have to get up before my kids. So if they, in sometimes, you know, they're unpredictable, but, but they're mostly getting my baby starting to get more predictable. So if I know if I get up at 6am, um, that I will have time alone to pray. Now it's a sacrifice because that's really hard because I love sleeping in. I love sleep. I really love sleep. <laughs> so that's, uh, but so it's like, how important is it to me to put them first? Well, I could just be like, well, I'll pray during the day at some point, but do I really believe the concept of putting him for, first puts things into order, which then makes revelation more possible. Like it's actually putting me in the holy order of God, which is the whole point by putting God first. I'm fulfilling the end from the beginning. And um, I hope that makes sense. <laughs> and, and entering that order so that then the rest of the things that happen throughout my life is this becomes patterns in my life. The rest of the things that happen just happen to flow better. Do I actually believe that can happen? If I put him first, that time managed to work works itself out because Everything will just happen in perfect time and order. Do I believe that actually happens? And that's where the belief part comes into play. It's like, okay, well, maybe I, maybe I believe that concept. So I'm, um, how many times the Lord tells us to like, to try him, to prove him, um, Malachi 410, that's the big, or 10, 4, 410, the big script, the tithing scripture where he says, prove me here with. I love that phrase. I think about that a lot. Like, well, how much faith do you have in me? Like, then prove it. That's what faith is. Put it into action and see what happens. And so um, putting the tithing first, putting the temple first, putting, making sure I'm on time to the, I'm on time to church. I'm on time to the places where he needs to be. And with people, if I've told somebody I'm going to be somewhere at a certain time, actually trying to do that. <laughs> it's harder when you have kids, but, but that just expands and, and trying again and showing how important now it's harder for me because I have kids, but now I have a new level of showing you how important it is for me. And I figure, you know, if I get up and if I end up having time to exercise for an hour a day, then I sure enough have time to pray before I do that um, or read my scriptures before I do that. And so President Nelson's talked a lot about us needing to um, read the Book of Mormon every day, and that we would be, this is interesting choice of words, he said, um, I wish I had that quote right now, again, the, I don't have all this planned before I talk, <laughs> um, 
um, he said that we would be immune to the the trials of the day or not the trials. I can't remember. I have to say it, but I think a lot of you probably know what quote I'm talking about, but, but he used the word immune and that if we read the Book of Mormon. Anyway, so I, I've been trying to do that, read the Book of Mormon every day. And then I had this prompting, you need to make it the first thing in the day and really put that belief in time and order into play. If I put God first then everything else falls into order and there's rest and protection in that. And so that's the, that's the faith part actually doing it. Um, and then growing in that. And then what I have found in my life is that then things start to fall into place. And then I start to witness it and I start to see occasionally miracles and then that turns my belief into more of a knowledge it's, and, and grows, right, stronger. So now my faith is stronger. My faith has more power because it's not like, oh, I think this will happen. It's I know this will happen. Um, one example I had of that, um, I was out I was out with a friend at the Tulip Festival at Thanksgiving Point here in Utah. And I, my daughter was a baby at the time. And I was supposed to be to a meeting. I had, like, I never forget things. Once you're a mom, it's a whole new level of gaining order <laughs> in your own mind. And I forgot that I was supposed to be showing somebody a house. I was working as a real estate agent and I forgot that I was supposed to be showing somebody a house. And I couldn't believe that I had forgot this person. And I felt awful that I had forgotten this person. Um, and I was deep into the tulip festival when it dawned on me. And I was like, oh no, I've got to go. I'm supposed to be there in 15 minutes. And it's 30 minutes away with all the stoplights and everything. And I only have, you know, a, I think they give you like a 30 minute window or something to see. I'm like, it's going to take me, I'm deep in to Thanksgiving point. I don't have my keys to get into the house. Um, it's, it's, well, it's, it's probably 30 minutes away from where I was. Anybody who knows I was at Thanksgiving point, I was going to Harriman. And so, and it was traffic hour <laughs> and there's a bazillion lights to get, it was like far out on the very far side, more by the copper, actually, I think it was in Riverton. So it was like by the copper mine and out there in the far West. So there's millions of lights in between here and there. And, and I've got 15 minutes to be there when, and then a little bit of window to do the showing. And I was like, almost hopeless. I don't know how I'm going to do this, <laughs> but I just started going. And my friend was there with me. She's like, do you want me to take your daughter home? And I was like, yeah, can you? And so she took her home and I rushed and ran through. <laughs> um, so that took a lot of time just to run through the Dula Festival. You get all the way out. Cause I was like in the back and then got all the way through, all the way through the parking lot. It was a big parking lot. And then got to my car, got in my car. And I'm like, oh, I've got to go home and get my keys. I just know I'm going to make this. I'm not going to make this. And as I'm, I, I'm driving, I'm about ready. I was about ready to get on the freeway. And that's when I realized I don't have my key fob to get into the, the home. And so I thought, shoot, I'm going, I'm going to have to go home. And that is going to, this would be so much longer, go home and then go back. And so then I got out of getting on, I was about to get ready, to get on the freeway. The light turned green and I was about to pull through to go to my house and miss getting on the freeway. And I heard a voice say, look in your um, console. And I opened my console real quick and there it was. I don't, it's never there. So I don't know how it got there. I had a blessing somewhere along the way. And so I got right back in the line, got on the freeway. And I'm like, but still, even if I have this, I'm still far. And then I just felt the spirit prompt, you know, you know how to do this. You know what to do. And when I thought about that, I thought gratitude. Gratitude has the power. We talked about this in my last video that President Nelson gave an 11 minute message on 11, 11 at 11 o'clock on gratitude. And I, I believe truly that gratitude has, has power over over a lot of things. And in another video, we'll go through frequencies and the frequencies of the mind, but but one of the things that they've been able to discover by measuring um, 
thought processes and actually charting the frequency waves that come off of it is gratitude is the highest one that they can discover is the most powerful one they can discover besides divine love. And if you were to ask me, divine love would be charity. That's, that's how we know it to be the pure love of God. And he gave his only begotten son. Um, and that is charity. And, but that's a gift that has to be given. So what's the closest thing that we can do to come to that? If that's something that has to be given, what's the thing, closest thing we can do to practice getting closer to that? It, from what I can tell, it's gratitude. <laughs> and so as I'm driving on the freeway, I felt just that saying, you know, you know what to do. And I thought, Grat gratitude. And I knew, I didn't know enough, but I knew gratitude had power. And in that moment, I thought, I am grateful. Like, I, I don't think you can fake it either and just say, oh, I'm grateful. Like, it has to be a real emotion <laughs> of the heart and the mind. And I thought, why? Well, actually, I am very grateful because somebody put that impression inside. You have somewhere to be. Um, I, I didn't say that, but when I was at the Tulip Festival, when it dawned on me, I had felt an impression you have, you're supposed to be somewhere. And so as I'm getting on the freeway, I'm thinking, wow, I am grateful. Somebody, somebody put that impression. Somebody's looking out for me. I, I was told I was supposed to be somewhere and I'm grateful for that. I even have a shot right now because somebody told me that this isn't a big deal. I mean, it was just the showing, but for me, it was a big deal. <laughs> and I learned so much from it. And the Lord does that in our little experiences. He teaches us a lot. If we'll let him, we don't listen in the little experiences. He'll make them harder experiences until we do know him. But <clears throat> blessed are those who willingly, uh, Nephi talks about those who willingly come to know the Lord versus those who are compelled to come to know the Lord. Um, I'd rather be seeking for him. Anyway, so I start thinking about that. I'm like, I am grateful. So I said a prayer of gratitude. So thank you for uh, whatever that impression was that alerted me that I was supposed to be somewhere. I, I clearly have a shot now. You, you clearly wanted me to understand that, um, that I was supposed to be there. This has some importance. And then I thought, and I'm so grateful that at the last moment, I felt to look in and see that the key fob was there. And I didn't have to go home to get it. And again, I now have a shot because of that. And so I sat there and I kept thinking of everything I was grateful for while I'm getting on the freeway and I'm driving. And the whole time I'm going, I was thinking gratitude and trying to really feel gratitude, not just fake it, but really feel it. And I hit every single green light on the way over there. There was probably 30. I don't even think that's possible. <laughs> Anybody who's driven from Lehigh to clear out in, uh, I mean, it's like daybreak area out there by Kennecott. You, your chances and traffic hour, your chances. I mean, there's so many roads and there were so many back roads I had to take. I was on the freeway and then I was on the highway, which has a bunch of stoplights. And then I was on all these back roads and every single green light. I didn't, I never had that happen. Every single green light. And I got there with like 10 minutes to still walk him through the house. And anyway, it was perfect timing. Everything just happened in perfect timing. And so I bring that up because I, I talked a little bit about gratitude in my last message. And we talked about the experience of 11-11 and why he chose 11. And, and there's more on that I wish I could say, but I think I'll leave it at that. But um, I do believe that the gratitude has has more power than we realize. And so um, I think these things are going to be important because if you look at um, if you look at the camps of the people who were the pioneers that were crossing, um, well, <laughs> one day I had an impression the Lord had me read the chapter heading of all the books of numbers said, so just go read all the chapter headings. Okay. <laughs> like a weird thing. But I went through and read and it was constantly like the Israelites whined, complained, they got plagued. They whined, they complained, they got plagued. They whined, they complained. They got... And they're like, there's a pattern here. <laughs> you whine and complain, you get plagued. And then I was reading the stories of the pioneers and how um, like the camps that seemed to whine and complain, they all got cholera 
but then the camps that were like more grateful is the only way I could say it. Um, that seemingly showed gratitude. The, that's where the prophets were chosen out of and um, the 12. And I thought, yeah, I think he's trying to show me a pattern here that gratitude really does have power. And um, so in coming days, you know, if we're preparing the world for the second coming, I feel like one of the biggest things that we can do um, well, in fact, I do feel to share more on this. One of the biggest things we can do is to help people reside in gratitude. So when 2020 hit for me, um, and, and this is going to tie in timing, being in the right place at the time or, or doing what you're told to do in time brings power and protection. Because about six months prior to 2020, before COVID, I had ha been having these feelings that I needed to um, get prepared. I was thinking for like earthquake or something. And I kept having these feelings. And so I went out and got our food storage ready and toilet paper <laughs> and just everything. And also six months earlier, six to eight months earlier, I had, I had had this impression I needed to start working on, um, my heart and, and some supplements I was taking for that. And when COVID hit, I found out that one of these supplements I was taking had had research uh, back in 2003 that um, had implications for the SARS virus in preventing the SARS virus from being able to replicate within the lungs, which was one of the issues that was having, happening with COVID. And I, I read that article and I thought, what? <laughs> I started taking that about six months ago and most because I had an impression. I remember, I remember hearing this voice say, you're going, you're going to take this. I know. Like, okay. So, so I did. And this is again, this seems crazy to the world when you tell stories like this, but what happened was when 2020 hit, I remember thinking, whoa, like what they said about COVID in January of 2020 was like, you will immediately die. You will, what we were hearing from China and from other places, like, this is, this is a death call. Like you, <laughs> you get this, your lungs shut down and you die. And that's what, that's all I knew. And so I was like everybody else, like in fear. And what if this comes over here? And, and before it came here, that's when I read about the SARS virus and the specific thing I was taking and and I thought um, it was just like a natural supplement. And in that moment, I thought, whoa, somebody's reaching out for me. Somebody was somebody was preparing me months ago for this. And in that moment, all fear went away because I, because I knew somebody, you would, if you wanted me to die from this, you wouldn't have, you know, I had, I had a new level of faith. Like you, I would not have been doing this had I had you wanted me to die from this. So it's suddenly I was not afraid of this virus. And then when the virus came and then everybody was going crazy for toilet paper, I got thinking, oh, I already have toilet paper. I felt like six months ago, I needed to start prepping for toilet paper. With toilet, toilet paper is one of the things I got. And I remember people calling me, they're so mad. There's no toilet paper. Everybody's taking it. And everybody was angry and contentious. And I remember being at home feeling like, I don't need to be at the grocery store right now fighting anybody. I don't need to be conditioned. I'm not mad at these people. I'm not here yelling about it because I was prepared beforehand. I was told to get toilet paper. Now, was it the end of the world? Do we not need that toilet paper? Um, you know, like it ended up being fine. <laughs> but I learned something really strong in that moment when I, I remember somebody complaining to me about um, the toilet paper issue and everything going on. And I was sitting in my kitchen and I thought in that moment, I felt all I could feel was gratitude. And I thought, I feel so grateful right now. Like I, I was perhaps for this. And then I heard a very clear voice, another very strong voice say, now that you know what it's like to be temporally prepared, imagine what it would feel like to be spiritually prepared. You need to get spiritually prepared. And um, and then I learned something about gratitude and its power, but through gratitude, it was not, I was not subject to the same fears that were going on because I 
all I could think of was somebody prepared me for this. So all I could think of how grateful I was that somebody did that. And then I suddenly felt this desire to make sure that the next time something happens, the next calamity that comes, I want to make sure people have the chance to feel the gratitude and to feel like somebody was watching out for them. <clears throat> Sorry, I cried out. <laughs> um, and so that's when I started asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? And I've talked before um, in some videos about how I felt impressed to get a freeze dryer. <laughs> and one of the reasons I felt very strongly impressed to get a freeze dryer was because the well, I was praying to know how can I practice consecration? And um, and that was his answer was go get a freeze dryer. <laughs> and at the time it made no sense. So of course I did it. <laughs> and it costed a bazillion dollars. And so of course I did it. It made no sense. But um now it makes total sense. But one of the things that really struck me about that was the the idea of being able to help prepare other people that if something were to happen and somebody who before, um, and I, I can think of a, a few people, close people I know who had nothing and didn't have the means or didn't have a spouse that was willing to contribute to that or whatever, they they struggled to get that. And, um, you know, if something were to happen and them to have, the things that they needed in their hand and have that same moment rather than, you know, say something happens and there's no food or, or something. And which with COVID, we've seen the real possibility of things shutting down. But if they had the, in that moment when something happened and everything they had, everything was quickly taken, their thought process may be, wow, how lucky are we to have the supply of things somebody was watching out for us versus we have nothing, we're scared, we're afraid. And that the power is really in the gratitude. That the gratitude overcomes the fear. And so with that, my learning of needing to be spiritual prepared came in seeking to help others learn to feel that, um, the power of that emotion too. And that I think um personally that's what zion is it'll ha it'll have power over when I, over everything else going on in the world because the power will be exuding from the people the light will be it will be the pure in heart and it will be um can you just imagine a community and we've had real life example of this we had a, a fire on our hill um and then that same week there was a fire in colorado and the whole the whole city was um or the whole neighborhood was burnt down and the difference between communities where the power of God is present and active versus the power of fear and <clears throat> and that those seeds get planted a long time ago we've learned that the seed versus the tree when the miracles happen they don't happen right in that moment they happen because the servants of God were planting the seeds <clears throat> And so I think about that a lot. Of what seeds are we out planting that are going to come to be our miracles in the future? And gratitude is one of those. So with that, one of the commissions I felt was to, to teach people to teach gratitude. And that when calamities and things happen, to help people, <clears throat> to help people come and put their minds in gratitude through um, gratitude and hope and inspiration through all the muck. And that in that, the miracles will come. And so like a community that is full of people, you know, if you have a massive earthquake and everything's torn down and a community that is focusing on, you know, gratitude in some way through the chaos versus another that is not um cholera is actually one of one of the most common things in natural disasters is cholera. And so <clears throat> I don't have all the answers, but I do feel prompted and commissioned to help 
plant those seeds to prepare people that the miracle one day will come when when the time is at hand and with our fire here um i there is rest and there is peace in the lord and i think one of those things that really stands out to me is um when we had our fire here <clears throat> and this is why time is so important by putting the lord first everything gets set in order and it doesn't mean that things are the chaos isn't going to ensue but it can change the experience through the chaos and when when that fire came through earlier that week <laughs> i had said a prayer to the lord and said is this where you want us to be do you want us are we in the right spot are we where we're supposed to be if you want us to move we'll move and um but just just let me know if we're in the right spot or not and um we had then like a few days later that fire came through and it was instant like i looked out the window and said we have to go there was no time to collect anything the wind was so strong and with the we gotta go and i grabbed my baby i went out the door my husband was going to follow behind me and i there was so much smoke i just had to i had to get her out of the smoke so other people stayed below and kind of watched but i took my daughter to my parents which is in south jordan and from south jordan we could see things exploding from it was the other side of the mountain um that where the fire was and where my house was so i was seeing over the mountain we could see big flashes going up and so I've seen houses go up in flames before. <laughs> and so um, I'm like, that's a house going up. That's that's what it looks like. They go from the huge fire and then they explode. And so I'm like, that's got to be houses. And once with that wind as bad as it was, once houses start going, they're all going to go. It was severe wind. <laughs> and um, I live in a very windy spot. And and that fire was moving so fast. It had started and was huge and at our doors before we even had time to think. And, and I thought, okay, um, those are houses going up. And mine was very close to the mountain. It's only a couple of houses down. So I thought, okay, my house has gone up in flames. Are going to be by the morning. I was texting people and they're like, it's so bad. <laughs> like, this is not getting better. The firemen couldn't get up. And it was, it was a consumption degree. <laughs> so I thought, okay, this is going to get consumed. And I remember going to bed and I went to bed and I slept. I, on my parents' floor, I fell asleep and I woke up the next morning and thought that my house was, I just assumed it was gone. The thing was I slept. I, you know, when you're an adult and these things, they cause you to stir all night. If you think your house and everything you own is about to be burned down, you're probably not going to sleep very well. But I slept and I slept in peace and I had so much peace. And when I, um, when I woke up, I was just okay. And I just said, okay, I think that's an answer. You, you want us, this is not where <laughs> I prayed this week to know where, if this is where you wanted us, this is not where you want us. So okay, we'll just start anew. And it might be kind of fun to just start fresh. And um, well, I just said, I'm a, wherever you want us to go, we'll go. And <laughs> I get back home and find out my house is still here in perfect condition and not a single home was burned. And then I heard about all the miracles that happened. There were some serious miracles where the firemen were, the wind died at the perfect time, just enough time to firemen. It was just this big miracle and everyone was praying and and that was everybody's first thought was, well, the people I was talking to, their first thought was to pray. My friend called me and she said, just pray. And, and I'm pretty sure I was praying out the door. So people's first thought was God, was to pray. And at least enough um, that I think that brought protection to the neighborhood. And for me, there was peace that night. I came home and, and so many people uh, couldn't sleep for months and the good they were afraid and um that this happening again and how could that happen and um i remember thinking oh, i just felt peace and the reason i felt peace was because a few days prior i felt prompted to pray to know where the lord wanted us and and then um so because of that right that revelation praying and turning to god in time putting his will first by the time a calamity came i felt at peace even amongst this awful thing that was happening 
And, and of course I care for the welfare of everybody else, but you know, it's a fire. There's only, but none of us want them to burn, but there's only so much you can do. And, and if, if the Lord needs us to learn something in it, then, then that's the way it is. But um, I do think there was power because, because everybody turned their hearts to God first. And um, <clears throat> when I got home the next day, I just had this overwhelming impression say, I want you to stay here, make this home your temple. And, and that I know where your heart is, but now you know. And just that, um, you know, I didn't know, could I leave everything behind? If the Lord asked me to go at any given point in time to just leave, could I? Could I actually do it? I don't know. I But, but I felt like that fire was almost... Uh, for me personally, everything's it's our own individual experiences. But for me, I felt like it was him saying, now you know. Like I knew where your heart was, but you didn't. Now you do. And that uh, I know that I could walk away from everything at any moment. My husband called me. He's like, what do you want me to get? Do you want me to take it? And I'm like, just leave. I don't know. <laughs> and he's put a lot of effort into our landscape. He's a landscape architect. And the next day people were like, what would you have done about all the work you put in your yard? And I'm like, I didn't, I, it didn't even cross my mind. I didn't even think about it. And I think that's the piece and the rest that he promises us is it's, it didn't matter. It, it was nothing. Um, and, and that's a big deal, especially if you knew how much effort we put into this house, <laughs> it was a big deal for me to learn that for myself, that um, God did come first. And that if he wanted me to move and he was going to burn my house to get me out of it, that was fine. And that I would be okay with that. And then I'd fall asleep in peace um, because I know it's, a, it, I just thought it was interesting. Like I slept so peaceful. I didn't stress. I woke up and I was just okay. And I just, all I did was have a conversation with her. That's where you want me to be. That's where I mean, if you want me not here, that's quite an answer. So I'll take it. <laughs> and um, and in the end, I think he's just like, yeah, I just wanted to show you where your heart was. And so that you would know. So anyway, that's another thing about just being prompted, uh, putting him first, um, how that might have changed things. These are not stories I meant to share, but it's kind of going into that. Um, I So... <clears throat> The the biggest thing here is like, what can you do now to put the word first? And how can you finitely improve that little by little so that he comes first? And is that going to present miracles? Um, and, and then gratitude might be another thing to actually implement. Simple principles, right? This is not a hard thing to conceive that here, that this is um, easy to say, oh yeah, I could pray first in the morning. But like, do you actually believe, do you actually believe that there's power in that? Um, prove it, see. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, one thing I didn't want to say, I started working in the temple recently as an ordinance worker. And one of the things that really stood out to me were these concepts, because now I'm in the background working and I've never done this before, but it is so important that you have a watch <laughs> and that you um, do things in the perfect time in the perfect order or everything gets thrown off i mean have you ever noticed you go to the temple and temple workers come in right at the right time to do the ordinances and every it just seems you're not like distracted by the workers you know if you were to go to mcdonald's and you're like i need a hamburger and they get in the back and they're like ah get in and you're like where's my hamburger it's not like that at the temple everything just runs smoothly so <clears throat> that's the patron perception um but then you have behind the veil <laughs> and and it's essentially it's just that to me i'm seeing this and now thinking this is what goes on beyond the veil is everything is happening in its perfect time and order because that's how god works everybody's where they need to be when everybody's fulfilling the work and um, we know they're busy on the other side of the veil and how important is it that they are where they need to be when and um, so, so they said it's really important to get a watch and they, they, because if you get off, you're rotating around doing things. If you get off, then that sets everybody else off. And it just made me 
think of this like yeah this is this is what beyond the veil would be is this multi-dimensional time where it's actually order everything's in order um and so there's no chaos and it creates a very peaceful environment and anyway i just thought it was really cool and one of the insights i've had as a worker so kind of once you come to believe these things and then put them into action and try the faith and then you get more witnesses right there's no witness until after the trial of your faith and then that begets more faith um <clears throat> i've had quite a few experiences where it's like time just was exactly what it needed to be when it needed to be and um each time that it's happened for me um i i have felt prompted what what uh what well i i heard you know what what were you focusing on you know when this happened i hear this voice so what what were you focusing on and, and one of these days that i had this miraculous experience in my life um more time seeping seemingly was just what it needed to be um i remember that morning i had been prompted by the spirit to focus on gratitude all day long just keep thinking oh i'm grateful for this and just find as much as i could throughout the day to be grateful for and so <laughs> we're going to tie that into something i call real-time revelation and we know um there's the scriptures that talk about take no thought for what you'll say for it'll be given to you in the moment what you need to say and and christ told one of the disciples you're going to add more time to the day by being anxious you know no <laughs> um so anxiety would be quite the opposite of of gratitude anxiety and fear and i don't think we realize like fear is a commandment thou shalt not fear it's a commandment <laughs> Like, so if we have fear inside, we have a lot of work to do because we're commanded not to fear. And that's, when I mean, you think of it that way, it's like, why? And because we'll talk about this in another one about the, the power of fear versus power of gratitude and literally breaking the bounds of the one with the other. But, um, but I think there is literal power in, in the mind to overcome through replacing anxiety fear with thoughts of gratitude and it's hard at first because if you're not used to it then it's kind of like you're faking it you have to build those neuron trains and which is another video we'll talk about uh fixing the brain and the neuron trains and um but but over time then it becomes more natural and, and you really feel it and then when you begin to think and feel it then then you gain the power um so and there's been these times in my life okay let's talk about time putting god first uh until we come what is christ trying to do he's trying to reunite us with the presence of the father and so if you think about god and you, you can't see god unless you can comprehend him which we'll talk about that in videos but god is um past present future he is all seeing um and he is the word and he's the creator and we know that when he speaks that the elements obey everything obeys his command and so what would it be like to be in the presence of the father in the mind and will of the father and i imagine that this is where the prophets have come to that when they speak it will happen because it was spoken through the mind and will of god it was spoken through them and thus the prophecy will be fulfilled right and um we're thinking about that the closer we come to his presence you know is there a time delay between when god says something and when something happens not from his realm you know, if he speaks they obey uh but you know if he speaks a few layers down and we're distance and then we hear and by the time we obey that's where we get that time is relative thing and so for us there's time and that's some mercy and grace to give us time to practice so for us that's there but to be truly in the mind of will and god would be able to these commands so like moses could command the elements 
um, he could part the Red Sea because, you know, the presence of God is, is he's much closer. He's become the spirit of revelation, essentially. So he's that mind and will are one in such a way that he's in the presence of God, that it, it can happen. And so we know that's one of the powers of the priesthood is to command the elements. And so thinking about that in the scriptures that say, take no thought because it will be given to you in the moment that you need it. Um, I think that's in Doctrine and Covenants somewhere, but I think about that one a lot because I've learned to not, I've learned to, to speak from the heart and not plan so much because I've learned that it's given to you whatever needs to be said in the moment needs to be said it, it, it is. And there's been a couple times, and this is what I call real, <laughs> real time revelation, where it's like, it's like God's right there like okay <laughs> it's like oh my goodness how did this happen and um one of them i was talking to a friend and i am like we we're talking about abiding in christ and i'm like yeah it's like that one scripture and i'm like i wish i had that right now and in that moment as i said it i got a text from a friend with the very scripture that i was talking about what i was talking was coming at the same moment I was talking it. Now, <laughs> imagine that, um, you know, Moses being in the presence of God or or that, 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 you know, when he speaks, it happens. And so as we come closer to our covenants with God, is it possible that he gives us in the very moment that we need it? Well, yeah, the, the scriptures tell us that will happen. And I've, I've had a few experiences like that where it's like, oh my goodness, um, another time, I was doing the dishes and I was putting the plates in the plate rack. And I had this quote from President Nelson it was was the one where he told us to read the Book of Mormon every day. And the missionaries had brought it over and I had put it in this rack. And as I was putting the dishes away, it fell down. And <laughs> now this really reminds me of Interstellar when the books fell down. <laughs> but it fell down out of the rack and I picked it up and I was reading it. And I was pondering on it. I was thinking about it. I'm like, yeah, I need to make sure I'm doing that every day. Like, I think that's actually really, really important. And then I put that down. I was in the middle of doing the dishes. So I don't know why I put, I don't get on Facebook a ton, but I put it down and went straight to Facebook, almost like I wasn't even paying attention. Opened it up. The first thing I saw on Facebook was somebody had posted the exact same one. And I'm like, what are the chances <laughs> that just happened? Um, so then there's a God for me. I, yeah, I need, is it a bad thing? No, I need to be doing this every day. And, um, and so then you have to think about, well, what was that person doing that they knew to post that at the very moment that I need it? What was the other person doing when they sent me the text at the very right moment? And I talked about this in my last video too, when another friend sent me a text, this happens to me all the time. And people don't even know how they're a part of what of my understanding. Like that friend just sent it, just following their own prompt, their own inspiration. Oh, I feel like I should share this message um, that... I feel like I should post this on Facebook. President Nelson just said that. And uh, having no idea what's going on in my life, that it was the right thing at the right moment. They were in the right place at the right time. I was at the right place at the right time. They intercollided. Now what happens if we all start doing that? We all start putting God first. Right place at the right time. You have Zion. And you have, in my mind, telecommunication. <laughs> you, you're able to understand in a higher dimension. And so... Um, it, there's so many examples I've had of this now where I, I expect it. I don't, it's not, it, it happens. My awareness of it is there to the point where like, yeah, I, I know it. it's, it's not like a, do I believe this anymore? I'm like, no, I know it. This is how the Lord works. It's just, you can't, you can't make that up. Um, by two or three witnesses should every word be established and, and, um, well, there's some I could say, and that we might say for another one about the two or three witnesses. But um, I think that and I actually have a, I feel prompted to share this other story. This one makes me look very small. <laughs> um, we're having a barbecue with some friends and there was a pond and one of my friends, they're they had their backs turned to the the their daughter who was like two at the time or 
one and a half or something. And, and I was watching her because my daughter was young too. And I was worried about the pond and they were climbing all around it. And so I had my eyes pretty close. I was a lifeguard. So I was like, uh, prone to look. And I was watching and sure enough, their daughter fell and went face first. And, and I like jumped, but then they saw me jump or people jump. And so they, dad jumped and went and got her. Um, and my instant thought, and this is where we have to learn charity over pride. My first thought was, um, and the wrong thought was, um, like, how could you have your backs turn when she's one and a half and the pawns right there? Like it was a, it was a judgment. Right. And so that's, that's why it makes me look little. <laughs> and I had this thought come through my mind that it said, do not judge them for this. And I instantly course correct and like, um, you know, repented. <laughs> There's power in instant course correction and putting God first. And, and I just thought, you know, it's an accident. It could happen to anyone and, and got my, tried to get my thoughts back online. And sure enough, um, a summer later, I'm at the pool with this friend and my daughter had had her life jacket on and then had taken it off and I didn't know, and then ran into the pool and got in the deep end and went. And that friend had a prompting to say, where's Lucy? Like, she, she hadn't ever, ever said that any other time, but she had a prompting to say, where's Lucy? And I looked and she was head under and I dove as fast as I could. And it was just interesting. It was the same friend I had judged. And I wonder, you know, is that why I felt prompted? Don't judge her course correct. Because the Lord knew coming in the future, she's going to save your daughter from the same thing. And so, um, cause I don't think I would have seen her and nobody else was watching and she wasn't watching. She just randomly, it wasn't as, it was as if she didn't even say it. She wasn't, she just, it's a, where's Lucy. It was, it was like, she didn't even know she was saying it almost. Um, and she wasn't even looking at her. She just, there's kids all over, you know, and like Lucy had been running around and it was just it's so interesting. It's just, where's Lucy? That maybe because of, I followed the prompting to not judge and to, to turn that around, that she then, the power was able to come through her to say, where's Lucy? And um, so again, protection in following and listening and um, something that could have been really devastating obviously i i didn't know how long she had been under there but um she to this day remembers me just diving and she's like wow mom you did that <laughs> like, well i thought you were dying and I, ironically enough my friend is also a lifeguard so um i don't know i just felt to share that story but um so the real i think we covered that real-time revelation of you know we there's sometimes we're given things that we need for the future like that's a good example of one hey course correct here because you don't know but in the future she's going to save your daughter um but um things that happened 20 years ago oh now i understand what that meant 20 years ago when i felt that versus um things that are happening in the moment in the very moment and i think that's one of the greatest promises of continuing on this path of learning to hear him and moving down the iron rod of person personal revelation directly to you, God's word to you, until you you hit the tree of life, which is Christ, who is the greatest seer of all. And um and being in his presence. Um and I feel like that's the majority of things here covering. Um I I've had a few times, and I don't know, I'm, I'm just this is kind of theory I'm putting out there, but um, proving this principle maybe as that the spirit moves faster than because the spirit is light. And so when the spirit, the reason it's so quiet is because it's so fast. And when the spirit impresses something on you or the Lord, it's very quick. And most of the things I felt have been very instantaneous feelings or voices or just very quick. Um, and what I've noticed is then doubt follows, doubt or fear, or um, that follows after. There will always be an adversary to come after to question. That that's 
just that idea, I guess is something I'm grappling with now is that um, the spirit is very fast. And so learning to maybe trust the quicker, the quicker one, because darkness can't move the way that the spirit can. It's it, it, this is the light of Christ. It's light. It's the speed of light <laughs> or faster. You know, speed of light is as much as we can comprehend now, but, but it is the fastest thing that we know. So wouldn't that be safe to say that if I'm feeling the impression and then a doubt that it was actually, it was actually the quicker, the quicker of it, the more silent, um, it just moved through real fast, but I think there might be something to that. And so that's all I, that's just a theory to put out there too, is, is maybe pay attention to the expect, expect other voices and pay attention to the quicker, faster, quieter one. <laughs> it should be quieter and it shouldn't be so loud. And um, the spirit is often very quiet. Um, and then the one thing I was going to add that I was thinking about when we were doing this is when timing, and we'll talk about music in a whole different episode here, but thinking about timing and perfect harmony, in perfect order and perfect rhythm and harmony, well, music is that. Music is, if you have a note that's slightly off, you've got distortion or um, just out of rhythm, out of balance, right? You can tell this does not sound good. <laughs> you can hear that that doesn't sound good. And so in music, it has timing. It's everything's got to be hitting time. It's got a beat. It's got rhythm. And then these notes move in and out depending on just like a solar system. And so just more things attesting to time and order. And we're going to set the timing first. Like we set the order first. And, you know, if somebody's going to play music and say what time signature are you in um, and what key are you in so that we can get order put together and then we can go. Because if everybody just came and just started jamming wherever they were at, it's going to sound awful. So first thing, you know, if you go to a jazz band where they do a lot of improv, they're going to say what time, what timing are you in and and uh, what what key signature. And then from there we can play and we can jam to We can feel with each other. Okay, so let's get proper order first and um putting again putting that first and though so simple to practice and i 100 percent i know <laughs> i know that you will be blessed by finding incremental little atomic habits ways of saying okay how can i practice putting god first what can i do um to me the safest to say is like prayer number one prayer comes first you talk to him first thing when you wake up last thing when you go to bed in the middle of the day the second something in your day happens something calamity in your day even a small one pray go straight to god um and then his word and always oh, so the other thing i say about his word and music is i think one thing i'm gonna understand is he is the word and when the word is planted in your heart and then grows in to the tree so when the word becomes a song um that's the tree of life there when when the word becomes perfect harmony and rhythm and it, it sings a song and we talk about the song of the heart and the songs of zion often because we each have our role to play somebody sent me the song by david archuleta it was glorious and he kind of talks about that like everybody has everybody has a everybody plays a part or something um that you just got to get your part. You figure out who you are in God. And that's all you have to do. We don't have to worry about what everybody else is doing because we don't understand that they may be <laughs> like, like my neighbor who ended up being one side my daughter. I could have criticized her all day long. And then turns out a year later, she saved my daughter, you know? Um, so we got to put all that aside and focus on our part, our role and put God first. And how do we do that? And, and then let the rhythm and harmony come together with each other and i hope that other people get i know as we get closer to zion closer to knowing the lord and comprehending god you can't comprehend god without seeing him in everybody else and seeing how he plays through everybody else he's he's the great musician and <laughs> we are his notes we are his instruments right and so if you think that you're somehow better than it it's just not going to happen um but we have to in fact that was in I've talked about the movie Interstellar in the last one. That was another thing that really fascinated me about that movie 
was in order for them to get to a high, they were trying to get to a fifth dimension. Then in order for them to, to leave the world, they had to leave the world because it was dying because of selfishness, essentially. And they had to um, they even get to a higher dimension. And what they found was like, nobody could make it happen because everybody was so focused on like the natural man or themselves that unless everybody could put others first and seek others, that was the only way they could rise to the fifth dimension. And the, and the Matt Damon character is like, that's not possible. And so he had given up and had become selfish. <laughs> and it's like, whoa, like you see that in the pioneer story, you know, that's how Zion's built. It's you have to be one heart and mind. And if you don't have enough faith that when the beggar comes to your door and it's your last meal of food, like the, the Elijah it was Elijah and prophet came and said, give me your last meal. And she got tested and did. And like, you can't, you can't show your faith. <laughs> you get like, I just, I just know that those are going to be the tests. But like, when you know, that's the test, there's so much peace in that. Cause you're like, Oh, I know this. I know this. <laughs> Try to trick me. And the Lord will say, prove me, see what you think. <laughs> and, um, and you know, if it ever came down to like, the world is going to destroy itself. Like there, there comes the real test is, is can you incorporate and are you going to be out tearing each other apart in an apocalypse or are you going to be building and helping sucker people? And that was the only thing that allowed them to get to the fifth dimension in interstellar was when he finally self-sacrificed himself. Um, that's the story of the guy when he finally self-sacrificed himself. And then in that story, he's talking about, he says, he, what he learns when he's in the, what do you call it? The, the, the Tesseract, the camera was called anyway, but he's, he's essentially in the black hole. You got to watch the show. I'm spoiling it, but sorry. <laughs> when he's in the black hole and he's like, he's seeing through the dimensions now and he's realizing how he was given information that led him there and that it was him that did it. And then he says something really important. He says, I'm doing for them what they did for me and who they are or whatever in the movie. I don't know, but um, it just made me think of the father shall turn their hearts to the children and children to their fathers. Otherwise the whole world would be wasted at his coming. That once you realize that you have to realize you're doing, you know, and I think it's Isaiah 22. It talks about the nail in the sure place somebody who realizes I'm doing for them what they did for me. And that suddenly temple work becomes everything because, um, because you realize that is, that is, um, what's the best way I can say this without, it's just without saying anything too sacred, but um, we're doing for them what they've already done for us. And that, that then temple work being part of that of course our our daily interactions too here in the temporal but in the spiritual also that love channeling um multiple dimensions to lift us to a higher realm to a higher order um to create the millennium that you know we're doing for them what they did for us and that the temple work is also a way of doing love to lift to lift us out of this world and out of the chaos into his order i just think if people really knew what the temple was doing what that work was doing for them as individuals for you personally you had any idea if you could see it all you would do you would not not be there every day <laughs> that's how i the more i learn i think oh my goodness i like Oh, I gotta, I wish I could be there as often as possible. I just I just want to be there as often as possible because it's starting to make sense that this is how we become everything is um part of Temple Works role in that and and what it's doing for me personally is um, by helping others is like if you only had any idea <laughs> like because we are so selfish that we don't do it because we're self. We got things we want to do at time. We're busy, blah, blah, blah. And so we don't do it. Not realizing <laughs> that if you did it, if you would let go of all that selfishness, you would get everything. <laughs> and um, that's the irony of it. But in the self-sacrifice, you gain 
you gain at all. <laughs> and I felt that way about Temple Word. Like, oh my gosh, if you only knew, we're so busy in all of the self of the world and everything we got to do in our day in our time and we're busy we can't if you only knew really how this was going to amount you that selfishness would be there <laughs> but you can't see through the selfishness to know you know what i mean so i just i feel very passionate about temple work in that way too that we're so clueless i feel like i only understand maybe a spectrum of what's really happening for my own family and myself by being involved in this work but i have seen so much that makes me realize all the promises that god is promising um in, in regards we'll talk about this in another video in us becoming like the city of enoch has everything to do with us turning to them and turning our hearts to the fathers and the fathers to the children so um, and fulfilling those covenants and really learning to understand them, that it's actually giving you all the blessings you could ever want. And so in that way, being selfish is the most selfish thing you could do. <laughs> and, uh, uh, he's so full of the irony, I feel like. Anyway, so one of the last things I want to talk about is um, uh, like the millennium and when we think about time, and we know in the millennium where there's going to continue to be work done. And it's not till the end of the millennium that the earth becomes celestial. And and where we're all at in our own personal progress, I, I think, is a really interesting to, thing to ponder on the Lord with what, what can be. Um, and so one thing that really stands out to me with time and like being in the presence of the light, it, just, just the idea of... Um, you know, what, do, what would it be like if you're standing next to the Savior versus if you're out in the world? You know, if Zion's being built while there's still chaos in the world um, and missionaries are going out to bring people in, that if the Lord has come or he dwells there and, and I, you know, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I just think, you know, we, we do know Adam and on and will happen and to sit there and be in the presence of the Lord. Like, what does that do relatively to time outside? You know, can he come in the twinkling of an eye? <laughs> can he come so quick that, that those in the world don't, don't even know that it happened, you know, and, and can you be with him for so long and not, I think about when he came to the Americas and he went to, he went through 2,500 people and bless them one by one and there seems to me at least just to me an element of time that, that would take a lot longer time than seemingly had and then when you think about the atonement itself the ability for him to walk every instant of life it there's an element of time there that is relative <laughs> to be able to do that in a three-hour period um in the, he when he's involved in the very thing that is making him, you know, is putting him in the presence of God. And so I just think about that, like, if you're standing next to the Savior versus if you're, you know, half a country away, and might we, might that be, was like a cool thing we'll get to experience um, and learn things about dimensions in the millennium when we're, we're there. Um, so I don't know, just something I like to think about. So to sum up, that's a lot of words, to just sum up the ideas of how to put this into practice and how to gain. And hopefully the Lord will give you more instruction personally as, as you're working to, to put God first. Um, but simple little things just uh, and ask him, you know, I mean, I can give you a few insights that are pretty obvious, but also ask him because he'll know. Uh, he'll know if you're doing something that is putting something else above him that maybe has your heart and and he doesn't. For me, one of the big things was, uh, it, it can be like the most random thing that you couldn't have thought of, but um, for me, it was a soda pop. Like when my daughter was born, every day she'd go to bed, it like became my uh, my vice. <laughs> like, adjusting to being a new mom and like, I, I'm like, 
by the time she goes down for a nap, I'm exhausted and I just want to sit and relax. So I would just sit. And sometimes I'd like, you know, I'd read a book or something and wasn't doing anything bad, but, but I put so much of my peace and like sitting down and having a nice cold cola and just sipping on it while, while she was napping. And, and I just felt like he said, your, your peace is in the substance. Your peace is not in me. And, um, and so I felt like I needed to give up soda for that reason. And I did. And it was an addiction in me. And that might have stemmed from <laughs> previous generations. My grandma was a big Coke drinker. And she might be on the other side of the veil saying, overcome this for me. <laughs> I don't know. But I but I did out of real love for Cola. I know she did too. And um, and I felt to give that up. And 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 instead I found that I wanted to sit and I would study. I just started studying scriptures during the day instead of that. And then it's always blesses you so much more. You, you sacrifice something and he blesses you in abundance and, and I'll do a whole video on abundance, but he, um, well, what I found was like, I didn't like eating greasy. If I couldn't have a soda, I didn't like eating greasy food. Um, because like, French fries and pizza. I love French fries and pizza and hamburgers and um, but but I love it because I love to drink I love to drinking a soda with it. And when I would after I gave up soda and then I would drink or I would eat something greasy, like it did not feel good in my stomach because there were no bubbles to kind of tame it, all the grease. So I just stopped eating out. Like I just so then that became a blessing because I no longer was eating out very much. And then I started cooking more food at home and, the, and then that helped the wallet, right? <laughs> it helped us save more money. And you just see these ripple effects. One little thing he says, Hey, try doing this just to get more peace of me and how that affected everything. And my energy level, um, I mean, since there's been a lot of things I felt prompted to do, but I noticed my energy level, like I don't need a nap and it's not like high energy, low, it's just constant, steady perfect energy all day long and wow who could have known <laughs> only him um and so and then I imagine my grandma was on the other side saying yeah she did it <laughs> so maybe there's maybe she gets to partake in that in some way too I don't know but um well I, I do think there's a lot to that but anyway so um just ask uh, my whole point is he'll he'll point to things if it seems weird to go with it. I mean, as long as it's not bad, obviously like cutting out soda was a good option. <laughs> it wasn't like, is this the Lord telling me or not? It was good. It was a good thing to do. I don't think anybody can argue that. Um, and there's been a lot of things I've been prompted to do. And it's like, okay, obviously this would be a good thing. I may just not want to, so I'll try to justify it, but it's definitely not going to harm anyone or anything for me to to follow this prompting and, and it shouldn't in the Lord's way. So he is the Lord of inspired inspiration. So anyway, um, just practice finding ways, put them first, uh, gratitude, uh, hope the, practice, the, put that first in your day too. After you've, you've done the prayer and you've done the scriptures, write a list of gratitude. Um, and then think about it throughout the day. I mean, it's simple, but it literally has power. Um, and, and it may not be natural at first, but you're rewiring those neurons, those the grooves in the brain that are deep and firing wrong. You're some something somebody said this in church today, and I've heard this before. Neurons that wire together, fire together, or something like that. That you need to reprogram that neuron train. And we'll do a whole video on that too. I have a couple of friends who are very wise in that, um, and especially in overcoming addiction. So we'll talk about that too. But but everything's an addiction. The soda was an addiction. Um, thought processes are an addiction. Learning to overcome them, bad thought processes, um, and lack of gratitude is one of those. It's a huge one. I think we're all anxiety builds when, when um, we can't see, you know, I would have felt very anxious about the fire, but I was more focused on the prompting I had had earlier to to pray if I was where I was supposed to be. So when the fire came, that's all I was focused on was, okay, is God giving me an answer? That's all I wanted to know. Was he speaking to me? And so rewiring our brains that way, I mean, this is, this is what it is to be spiritually prepared. You know, it's good to be temporally prepared. In the end, how good would it feel to be spiritually prepared? But 
we are ready in any given situation. So, um, and I think that, I think that's, you know, um, oh, more I would say on, on being on time, but, um, and keeping to your word, you know, when we learning, like God sticks to his word and, and being on time. So we'll talk a little bit more about time in that way when we talk about the word, um, and learning to be like God in that way. And so, yeah, anyway, thanks for watching and we'll end there.